group hug. Please come and join me on the sofa. Today I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Matthew Newman. He is Head of Dispute Resolution at Ogier in Guernsey. Matthew, how are you? I'm very well, thanks Karen. How are you? Really good. So for viewers, please, if you enjoy this session, please press the thumbs up. And if you subscribe to our notifications, we can let you know about other podcasts and live sessions that we're doing. So Matthew, tell us about yourself, OGA, and the practice and the kind of things you're working on. Thanks, Karen. Um, so I joined OGA in 2008. Um, I've always been in Guernsey um, since 2008. I was at DLA Piper before that for eight years. Um, so been a, a lawyer for 20 odd years or so now, scarily. Um, OGA was a, a relatively sort of medium sized offshore law firm when I joined it in 2008 and it's grown exponentially since then. I think that the number of partners has doubled and actually the average age of the partners has significantly, significantly come down as well actually. So uh, it makes it a much more sort of collegiate collaborative firm to work at. Um, and I've seen uh, since I've been at Osier and Guernsey uh, a, a huge uptick in the quality of work which we are now doing in, in the DR team. Uh, it's been uh, a, a sort of fantastic 12 years of doing a, a really a really nice mix of contentious trust, contentious insolvency work, um, proper commercial litigation as well actually, the odd large construction claim, proceeds of crime work, um, so all the sorts of things that I suppose one would expect to see offshore and we get to do it all here in, in uh, Little Old Guernsey which is fantastic. Uh, so um, it's uh, it's been a been a good ride so far I have to say. Amazing and I um, we do know about the rise in litigation in Guernsey. Uh, we've spoken to a number of lawyers there but I think the main um, the main reason it seems is contentious trusts, although very interesting on the construction front, as you're saying. So what are the themes? Let's have a discussion on that topic. What's the themes? Um, so we've seen um, on the contentious trust side, especially, actually, we, we, we do the whole gamut of, of contentious trust work. So we act for trustees and beneficiaries. Uh, I've done removal applications on both sides of the fence. Um, I've been acting for the last nine years on a particularly difficult uh, contentious trust matter which uh, has seen, I think, every single issue that one could possibly find in the trust arising. Uh, and it's still going on today, still I'm doing calls on it every single day, and I pretty much have done for the past nine years. Uh, it's been in court twice with reported judgments, which are differently labelled, because it's obviously we don't want to identify the, the, uh, the family involved. It's a, it's, a, it's a very large family trust. Um, we've also had a number of applications, uh, for example, proceeds of crime type work, actually, which does trust uh, touch on the contentious trust market because you will have some beneficiaries who perhaps have settled money or that, that monies have been settled into trust uh perhaps not come from the um the, the best source shall we say and uh, the, the the trustees have um, perhaps later discovered that fact um and have made a suspicious activity report and then the money's effectively being frozen um so we've been acting for both trustees and beneficiaries in those those scenarios as well so there's a, quite a big overlap um, and another theme which I think uh, shows another overlap is, is with insolvency. So the, the rise of these so-called insolvent trusts um, and how trusts which don't have any liquidity, um, for example, or perhaps the if they own property, the, the loan to value ratio has gone south, uh, how trustees are coping with those issues. So we've seen quite a few of those types of pieces of work. I've not seen any of those come to court particularly yet. I think they've all been resolved sort of behind the scenes. Uh, but I'm obviously I'm aware of the, the recent Dead Trust decision in Jersey, which is obviously going to be very uh, uh, helpful for us in Guernsey if those sorts of cases ever, ever come to court here. So there's a real, I think, just because it's a trust, it doesn't mean it's a standalone uh, thing. I think it does overlap with many other areas of law. And I think um, being a, a more generalist litigator as I am and as, as my team is, I think it helps because we can bring that general knowledge which, which we have from other areas of law into the trust sphere. Um, and that, that's the best way of advising our clients. And we're going to move on in a minute to look at the general environment. But um, one thing that uh, may not be understood by viewers is, is that the Guernsey courts might be different to the UK courts or international courts. So give us a lowdown on that. Yeah, sure. So the Royal Court of Guernsey is it's a relatively small court. Um, we don't have any, um, as far as the work that, which I do is concerned, we don't have any divisions. It's the ordinary division, it, it's what it's called. Um, our, um, our chief judge is the bailiff, um, who isn't someone who comes and knocks on your door and demands money. He is actually our chief judge, but he's also the, the presiding officer of the States of Deliberation, which is our parliament here as well. 
Um, he's assisted by a deputy bailiff and then they appoint lieutenant bailiffs as well, um, who sit on a sort of part time basis. And there's, there's currently, I think, about 10 judges, some of whom are the lieutenant bailiffs is quite specialised. For example, they might do family law only, um, but quite a few of them are, are, are very generalist, as are, as are the advocates here. Um, and because obviously it's a small jurisdiction, you, you do know your judge as well. Um, and that does help um, on some cases, not necessarily trust cases, actually, but on on more sort of commercial litigation or even breach of trust, you know, negligence type cases. Um, the judge is the um, the person who finds questions of law, but we have jurats who sit and um, and, and find questions of fact. Um, and they are draw people drawn from the community and they're elected um, by the states of election. And it's quite an honour to be elected as a juror, you have to be pretty much a fine upstanding citizen of Guernsey. Um, and then you decide questions of fact in court on, on civil and, and criminal cases, actually, but we still have them on, on civil cases. Um, you normally have two or three sitting um, with a judge um, and, and they decide those, those questions. And they sit on not only um, civil trials, but also um, in, in, insolvency applications um as well so they're they're quite um they work quite hard actually but that's a peculiarity to both the guernsey and the jersey system is that we have we have the jurat system um judges can sit alone if they want um, to determine questions of fact but it's quite rare nowadays actually i think most parties like the jurats because it's a little bit unpredictable and if perhaps you've got a defendant or a plaintiff who perhaps you think might have more sympathy with with with, with the lay people uh, then you, you would want jurats in your trial because they're more likely to find in your favour, I think. Um, so uh, that's, that is really one of the main differences, I think, between, between Guernsey and, and, and the UK. Super interesting. So one of the themes that we've learned about is corporate prosecutions, which uh, litigation. Um, and so I'm guessing that that would be something to do with trustees being uh, sued or things that are coming onto your desk. Is that right? Um, uh, corporate prosecutions, to my mind, conjures up where you have sort of corporate manslaughter or something like that, which we, we don't we don't see here. I mean, clearly, we do see a lot of breach of trust claims. I just just uh, issued one on Friday for sixty million dollars, actually. Uh, so we do see we do see breach of trust claims um, regularly, but those are obviously more civil. Uh, well, that they are civil claims, um, really founded in in negligence or gross negligence normally. So nothing to do with any criminal element particularly. Thank you. And so, give us some more themes. What are your clients ringing you about? What what are the um, the problems they're experiencing or things that they want to have a look at. One of the interesting themes we saw was sanctions and how they're applied to different countries. We've seen unexplained wealth orders. But uh, the, the the feedback we've got is it's, it's more niche and there's very much more specific things that are coming to people's attention. So what are clients ringing you about? Well, I think there are two main um, things that we are seeing at the moment in terms of what people are asking us to do. Um, and it really comes down to trust and insolvency. And those are, are I think, the, the two mainstays of offshore work. So um, we're seeing a lot of inquiries, at, 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 I suppose, as you would imagine at the moment, given the state of the world um, on, on the insolvency side, um, especially at the moment on non-contentious restructuring work. But that is developing now into more enforcement type of work. So we're seeing quite a lot of that coming through. And I, I have to say, I expect that to um, only um, augment over the next six to nine months, I think, as we go through the year and things start to get back to normal in the UK, especially, um, and perhaps government support, um, economic support um, starts to diminish. I think we'll see um, quite an uptick in insolvency work. Um, on the trust side, um, and actually on the more, I suppose, shareholder dispute side, uh, we're seeing um, quite, quite a lot of issues about investment loss and, and how trustees or investment managers or whoever should have done a better job uh, in, in, in dealing with assets. Um, and some, sometimes those queries don't really go anywhere because when you actually look at it in the round, they're, they're doing their job and actually they couldn't have done any better because it's just how the world has performed over the last few years. Sometimes you do see some fairly egregious behaviour where trustees have just completely fallen asleep at the wheel um, or investment managers have perhaps made a very wrong decision or perhaps misunderstood the investment mandate or something like that. So we're seeing we're seeing quite a bit of that. Um, we're also seeing a bit of shareholder dispute work as well coming through uh, normally in sort of 50% um, each shareholding companies. Um, 
um, but also quite a bit of shareholder activist work as well. Over the years, we've seen quite a bit of shareholder activist work, normally by American hedge funds who have been investing into Guernsey investment schemes, um, very, very large Guernsey investment schemes, and they just want to know how to stir up trouble to get what they want. Um, so we've never gone to court on these things, but it's the old threatening letter and perhaps uh, in, that will then help engagement with those who are running the fund um, for the activists to either increase their shareholding or get a um, get a redemption or whatever they, they want to do. So we've seen those sorts of things over the years. And you mentioned sanctions as well. And actually, we've got one, one case where we have had to engage the sanctions authority in Guernsey because we've been dealing with the Libyan Investment Authority um, as a, a shareholder of a Guernsey company which is in liquidation. Um, and because of that, we've had to um, get, get to grips with the sanctions legislation, which um, of course we have in Guernsey uh, as much as you have in the UK. And it's based on effectively the EU sanctions regime as, as was, as did apply to the UK, uh, which is of course based on the UN sanctions regime. So we've had to get to grips with all of that, but that's been, that, that's been quite an interesting case because it's not something which I have to say you come across that much in, in, in Guernsey. So that's been, that's been interesting. Super interesting. So give the viewers some examples, perhaps, of the kind of cases which I understand not names connected to any of your cases, but things that would help them uh, have your points illustrated about what kind of people would be calling you about these sorts of litigations. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, most of the calls that we get um, tend to be from um, on, on the institutional side, if I can call it that professional trustees, professional insolvency practitioners, bankers um, or law firms in, in the UK, the US or elsewhere who are looking for Guernsey assistance. And sometimes it's just some advice on, say, Guernsey enforcement, enforcement of a judgment in Guernsey or um, Guernsey civil procedure because it would help um, some asset tracing um, uh, a project elsewhere. Um, and they just need some advice to get that Guernsey, that, 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 that Guernsey uh, piece of the jigsaw um, in there. Um, I suppose um, we also get uh, quite a lot of calls from beneficiaries as well or from beneficial owners of companies or from people who have been investing in schemes who have found that they, um, you know, they, they, they've suffered the loss I was talking about, about, about earlier. So we're not we're not particularly fussy in the sorts of people who we who we take instructions from. Um, I say particularly because obviously there's some people we don't want instructions from, but for the most part, we we act for both the 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 the, the trustee bank insolvency practitioner on the one hand and the creditor beneficiary um, shareholder on on the other hand. We we do it all, and I think that experience because we can do both sides of the coin. When we're acting for one side or the other, we know vaguely what the other side is going to be doing. Um, and we can sort of preempt that because we, you know, if we were advising the other side, we'd be, we'd be telling them to do X, Y, and Z. And normally their lawyers are telling them to do X, Y, and Z. So it just brings that slight element of predictability to litigation, which can be, I think, very unpredictable uh, most of the time. So it just, it just I think it, it helps. It helps everybody to, to know that we understand what the other side may well be wanting to do. Interesting. And... Any international, any international themes that you have? Any particular countries that are coming to you? You've mentioned America and people looking at shareholder activist kind of themes, but anything else on that front? And also maybe you could just wade in on beneficiaries. And you said a lot of them, there's really, sometimes they call you and they want to do litigation saying they're not getting returns on investments in their trusts. But are there sort of three top tips for the reasons you're not going to get anywhere with a, lit a litigation for anyone watching who's thinking of doing that? Yeah, okay. I, I'll deal with the, the country thing first. So um, I suppose last, I saw quite a lot of interaction with the United States last year, actually. Uh, I'm coming into this year as well. I've got three or four cases where there are either concurrent proceedings going on in Guernsey and New York normally, um, or there's a real, really strong New York connection. Um, it just seems we've, we've had a bit of, bit of a run of them recently. Um, and these tend to be because um, agreements are either subject to New York law um, or there are assets in the United States um, or, or something like that. So we've had, we had a very long running uh, chapter 15 recognition of a Guernsey administration order. Um, a couple of years ago, which which was contested, um, 
I've got a, a current set of proceedings um, here, which uh, we're defending administration proceedings in Guernsey, but the, the matter has been kicked off to allow a substantive issue between the parties to be determined in New York, where they agreed to determine those matters. Those are just two, very, you know, two, two examples of that. Um, so we're seeing quite a lot of, of things from the United States. Um, we've had things recently from Cyprus, from the Middle East, um, from France, from Germany, um, obviously from the UK is where we get most of our instructions. Uh, most of them come through the London uh, law firms and, and regional law firms. Um, so all over the world, really. Um, I've, you know, I've had instructions before from Brazil, from South Africa, from Australia. Um, so it, it's it, in India. I've got a case, a shoulder dispute involving Indian uh, beneficiaries at the moment. Um, it, it's it's amazing how many people use Guernsey vehicles um, for, for to either to um, to put their family wealth in place or to or to, or to run businesses. It, it never ceases to amaze me, actually. Um, on your second question about the sort of three top tips, so. I suppose um, if you're someone who you think your trustee or your investment manager has incurred a loss on your behalf, um, I suppose the, the, the three reasons why you might not end up um, having a claim at all, I think the first one is fairly obvious, it's limitation, um, or we call it prescription in Guernsey. Um, so if you're, if you're suing a trustee, you only have three years from the date of breach um, to, to sue albeit that date starts when knowledge uh, is accrued. Um, so you, have to, you haven't got very, very long, actually. If it's an investment manager, then that's normally a contractual relationship, so that's six years. Um, okay. But still, it depends when the, when the, when the loss incurred. Uh, and again, knowledge is a relevant factor there. So it, it just it depends, but you don't have that long. The other, the other I suppose, top tip is that your, um, your trust instrument or your um, investment management contract um, may well have an exculpation clause in there. In fact, it probably will have an exculpation clause in there so that the, 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 the trustee or the investment manager is not liable for um, certain acts um, or omissions, um, depending on what the contract says. And, and, and in fact, it may even seek indemnity, indemnification from, from, from the beneficiary um in respect of any losses so you've got to be quite careful when looking at the relationship between um the parties to see whether there is that exculpation or indemnity um there and i suppose the third reason is probably a bit more um substantive which is have you actually suffered a loss because you may think that on paper your investment's gone down but actually is that just a general trend in the market is that what what's actually you know is it could could that have been avoided or not and in as i said before in a lot of cases actually it, it couldn't have been avoided and the trustee or the, the investment manager has done all they can um to 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 shore up the position but it's just that is the way of the world um and, and really you've got to look much more closely at, at whether there was a breach and whether that caused a loss because that's obviously the legal test for negligence and um, just saying, oh, my fund's gone down by a million pounds isn't really going to cut it. You have to, you have to, you have to have that test of breach, causation, and loss, um, and it's got to be a lot more than well. The markets didn't perform very well, um, so th that's actually quite often the the main sticking point for people who come to us is when when we look at their cases, it's just it's it, it, it's not it it's based on them looking at a, a statement normally and seeing that there's perhaps been a, um, a negative return rather than a positive return but that's often not the fault of, of the of the uh, the, the uh, manager um, so I suppose if, if yeah, those are my those, those are my three top tips I would say so check your contract carefully understand the wording and understand what the general global conditions are because if the global conditions are like the pandemic where everything suffered a humongous hit the the likelihood you're going to get some traction on that does seem to be lower than higher doesn't it i guess yeah agreed and also check your timing as well so don't don't wait too long otherwise you might be out of time yes yeah, so three years or six years depending on what the situation yeah. is yeah so finishing off, anything that the crypto world has gone crazy with some SEC litigations and Bitcoin. And I guess that's going to start rolling around some desks as the the uh, the price of Bitcoin goes up and cash is accumulated. So just finishing off, any thoughts on that? Doesn't matter if you don't have any. And also maybe a thought on post COVID. I mean, how do you see the landscape finishing up um, and what are your thoughts? 
Um, on Bitcoin, um, I know that our my, my Cayman colleagues um, and my Luxembourg colleagues are very uh, into that. There's, they, they, they're doing a lot of cryptocurrency funds at the moment. I'm not sure there's been much litigation around that offshore at the moment. Um, certainly there's been a lot of talk about it. And when I've been to conferences, um, people have been talking about it a lot, but I don't think I've, I don't think there's been very much out there yet. And certainly we've seen none in Guernsey as far as I'm aware. Um, I, I, I always try to make a point of understanding how it works and then I promptly forget about it and have to re-educate myself every time. <laughs> so it is quite complicated. Uh, so hopefully um, there'll be something coming along at some point, but I think it's more likely to be Cayman focused rather than Channel Islands focused. Um, so in terms of the post COVID themes, I think one of the things that we will definitely be seeing is a lot more restructuring and solvency work. Um, so we at Asia have set up our restructuring and corporate recovery group last year, and I'm now the global head um, of that group. Um, we're a multi-jurisdictional, um, obviously cross-service line group. So we've got the sort of banking and corporate lawyers doing the restructuring side and the refinancing side, which as a litigator, I wouldn't touch with the barge pole. Um, and then equally, um, when it comes to the enforcement side of things, then that gets handed over to, to us litigators, which I'm sure they wouldn't touch with the barge pole. So we're, um, we, we're a fairly sort of collaborative group in that respect. And I think we are, we are expecting, and I understand the big four accountancy firms are also expecting to see an uptick in insolvency work um, towards the end of this year and into next year. Um, as I said before, if once the government um, economic support ends, which is going to have to at some point around the world, um, and, and the banks realise that they just don't have enough credit to keep propping up their, the businesses that they've, they've put money into. I, I think we're going to see issues. I also think we're going to see property issues as well. There's a lot of Guernsey companies, for example, which are used as vehicles for holding UK uh, commercial property and, and, and residential property. Uh, and I think loan to values are, are going to go, go, go the wrong way. Um, so we're going to see banks starting to protect themselves. Um, by either enforcing um, in, in some way, which may well involve Guernsey if it's a Guernsey vehicle, um, and and, uh, and and making sure that that you know those, those those loans are protected. So I think I think we'll see quite an uptick of work, and I think that's going to also follow through as we were talking about before into the investment loss space because the markets I think are not going to do that well um, post COVID. I'd be very surprised if they if if they bounce back immediately, and I think we'll, we may see. Um, some movement on those investment loss claims as well, um, both on the on the, on the trustee side and on the and on the, the the investment scheme side itself, the the, the, the uh, corporate side. Amazing. Well, congrats on the new role. It sounds uh, incredible. Keep up the good work, and thank you so much for joining us today. And we look forward to seeing you in better times. Thank you very much, Karen. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for joining us on our live session today. Don't forget to press the thumbs up and subscribe. We have these uh, live sessions twice a week, Tuesdays and Fridays. Follow us on LinkedIn, on Instagram and also on Twitter.